Now we want to say good morning to a friend of ours on the program, Valerie Ledford, who's been on the show many times over the last, I think it's, this goes back to like 2017, Val, if I'm correct. It's possible. It's It's been a while. Right? Yeah. Yeah. What, well, when was, when was the, the whole scandal in, in uh, Berkeley County with special ed in the classroom and such? Was that more like 2019? That might have been 19. Okay, maybe that's right. Because that's when I, I first I think it. my issues started in 17, so well, yes. when they exploded. Right. And you've since published a book, if not, uh, what, uh, are you up to three now? Um, just two. I'm writing my, um, I'm in the process of writing a third. I don't know if it's going to turn into a book or just a short story. And you mentioned just before the show that you won a competition? I did um, for Angora House. They um, do a writing competition every year, and um, they select 25 stories. Um, I submitted thinking, oh, well, I'll just get free cleanup of, and editing of my story, and it won't go in. But um, they accepted it, and then I ended up winning third place. So I was... Um, extremely excited i actually got paid for it so. <laughs> Congratulations. even better right <laughs> that's great there's yeah. there's that line about uh, the, that that first sale was the favorite money you, you ever made until all the rest of the money arrived after right. that too writing's a, a, a lot of time and um energy and um it's a lot of dreams and imagination but um there's not there's not a whole lot of money in it like people think a lot of times um but i enjoy it it's one of my passions i write about mental health just to get people to think and break the stigma and i'm sure uh, much of our audience is familiar but uh, not all with your own personal story in adopting two special needs children you were trying to keep a brother and a sister together yes yes that was my um my book that i wrote um, about my journey as a mother and the difficulties in our fractured system. Yeah, and has there been any improvement in the system in West Virginia with the split up of uh, Department of Health and Human Services to address these needs within the state so you don't have to go out of the state? Um, no. I don't think the system has addressed that whatsoever. From what I have seen, they're um, pushing that children stay at home, which is the first place they should stay. But there's no resources here. And you can't always have a child at home. Sometimes they need more help than what the parents or the community can give them. And West Virginia has absolutely none of that, especially in this area where we need it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and you know, you you stop me where you want to stop me or you oh, no, go where fine. you want to go. But uh, obviously for your daughter, it worked out that you could provide uh, yes. a, a healthy environment at home, but for your son, it did not. It did not. My son's needs were very, very extreme um, to the fact that we were told that he he wasn't safe in a home environment, but he also wasn't safe in an institutional, yeah, in a facility like environment. So mm -hmm. they couldn't take him. So their their next choice was, well, we'll send him home. Well, you just said professionals can't help them. So how do you expect two adults who tried their hardest, but you've got people who are supposed to know better than us who can't do it? I don't, I don't mean to pry. No. Yeah. Please pry. Isn't, okay. Isn't safe means self-destructive or Too dangerous violence? for himself and others. Okay. Those were their words. And through evidence of acting out and... and causing harm to himself and others yes okay yes to the point where court was involved in order to get placement because we had used up all parental placements so then what is the next step um there is no next step what should be the next step well at that point we had had um juvenile justice involved because the facilities wouldn't hold him so the courts got involved, and that's something where basically— Let me take a step back from it. What yes. facilities do we have that might have held him? Um, in Berkeley County, we have—I don't think we have any now. There used to be the Board of Child Care, but I don't think he Which is a residential health care facility? Yes. Some of them can go home, and I believe some of them—most of them stayed. Um, but they have a lot of out-of-state— children as well i know they were shut down a couple years ago i don't know if they reopened 
Um, when we first started dealing with things, it was um, an acute psychiatric hold to figure out what was going on, get meds correct. And that was in this past Morgantown. I can't think of the name right now. Well, that says enough. Yes. It, it was it was a good hour and a half drive. We drove them up in the middle of the night, um, did our intake, um, came home. As soon as you know, we were to the point where we were exhausted to go to sleep, we got a phone call. You need to come back. You have to do these things. And it's like, why didn't you tell us that when we were there? We would have just stayed the night or we would have done it before. And we how left. old was he? He was nine. Oh, my goodness. No, excuse me. He was eight that time. The first time he was hospitalized and then um, the next time the facility that was able to take him in was in Hagerstown and then um, Hagerstown took him back again they sent him home after the day after he had um, threw a chair at us and told us how he was going to kill us when we got home um, the only reason he ended up staying the night was because the nurse said he couldn't leave and both her and I fought the psychiatrist. So they kept him alone in a room by himself until the next morning and told us that we had to take him and wouldn't allow us to see him until discharge paperwork was finished. Even though if he had been home and threatened anything, as a parent, we are legally responsible to take our child to the ER and have them assessed. And start, so it, <clears throat> it's a catch-22. It's a loop. Yes. It's a loophole. And then, and I interrupted you, so then the next step is to the juvenile detention. Uh, well, we did residential care. We worked with an advocate to do residential care um, because of our child's behavior. He wasn't making progress. So insurance wouldn't cover it. But the facility told us he was making progress, I guess, to make us feel comfortable to take him home. We fought it because we knew better. Um, the advocate worked with us. Um, I ended up contacting local senators who hooked me up with the insurance li liaisons who I spoke with who said they could give me information, but they could not add any information I gave them. And they told me to contact the insurance commissioner, which got us to the point where we could move our child from that facility to another one that we thought would work better. And this was after our child had admitted to doing things which involved the courts later. He was, um, abusing his his sister in every sense of that word and um they told us we were overreacting threatened to send him home regardless we we had to fight tooth and we had to know our rights in order to get the facilities to do what they should have been doing to begin with and this is the subject of your book um the subject of my book is actually my whole journey from when I was just deciding to foster to going through the process to all of all of the nitty gritty to today. And the title of the book is? It's End of the Rainbow, A Memoir of a Mother's Journey. Wow. You know, I, we've talked on this on the show before that uh, and I, I'm going to guess that what what you're talking about here is not one of one. Oh no I um I'm in Facebook groups with parents that have children just just like mine and it's an everyday occurrence all over the United States. So when we hear on the heels of of <coughs> tragedies that that happen in, involving kids that um that there are warning signs and parents should have done this or they should have done that what I'm hearing is what's the point um, what 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 the um, what the system will tell you is it's your fault you deal with it and then when it happens it's still your fault because you didn't deal with it <laughs> can, can, what's, can Can't I win can I ask what the end of the story is I mean, obviously is it on it's ongoing how is the young man now 
Um, I don't know. I'm actually not his parent any longer in order to get the treatment that he needed. And um, for my daughter to get her treatment, continue doing well, and both of them have healthy relationships, we had to um, relinquish our rights. And as far as I know, because I, I get little tidbits of things I'm not supposed to get, again, the system, um, still going back between juvenile detention and residential care because you can only stay in residential care for a year according to Medicaid and then they have to switch you to another facility whether you're progressing or not. Now you mentioned juvenile care has he turned your son former son turned 18 years old yet? No he's got two years. In your book you mentioned that he had threatened to kill you when he got out and at 18 did they have to release at 18, whether he's yeah. doing good or not, he can walk. They release him at 18. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't need to follow up with that to ask if that's a concern of yours because it's got to be. Oh, absolutely. Um, the closer it gets, the, the more I um, get a little antsy to get a new place to live. Does he automatically get released at the age of 18 or does he have to pass certain aptitude tests? Oh, there's no aptitude. He turns 18. He's an adult. They can't hold him in juvenile anymore but, and he, would everything he get transferred is, to an adult facility no there's no chance of that not unless he goes to court and goes through that system again does he go through professional psychiatrists to ask if he still has these feelings uh, does he still have this anger does he still have this determination of who he's going to kill when he gets out does any of that get fleshed out no and that's that's the problem with the the adult system is they don't get that when their insurance gives up in a year either they just get let out is he in the juvenile justice system because of crimes committed or be, for mental that's, health issues? That's why we had we pursued that area because the mental health areas weren't being addressed. So we we had to um, make the decision to make sure that the abuse that he perpetrated was was addressed in the courts. Now, of course, everything will be sealed. Nobody will know anything. Um, because that's that's how the system works, which is sad because you need to know these things so that if something bad happens, well, you, you kind of knew it was coming. Are there many parents in West Virginia who are going through what you are going through or went through? Um, I, I know of, of several that are, are similar, that children have the same diagnosis. Um, so I can say yes to that. Um, when it comes to other parts in the system, I know they are. I don't speak to them, but I, it's a systemic thing. So we're all dealing with it. And, and it comes down to their schools because we're, we're dealing with it in our schools too. Well, you mentioned schools. Uh, we've had uh, in Jefferson and in Berkeley County, we've had changes at the superintendent level in, in both counties within yes. the last year or so and you work in the jefferson county school system any changes that you've been able to see firsthand um <clears throat> the school i was in this year was was great um a lot of that had to do with administration um i have had some conversations with the new superintendent i do believe in jefferson or berkeley um in jefferson and um i believe there's a lot of good work going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. Um, one of the conversations we had, he um, mentioned where he, we need to have some overlap in our departments that we don't have. So he, he's hoping to bring that in, which, which I totally agree. We can't work in cells. We, we mm -hmm. have to have that overlap or we're just going to constantly have gaps everywhere. You live in Berkeley County. You've run for Board of Education a couple of times. You work in Jefferson County. Do you feel you give a pretty good comparison of the two counties in terms of how they deal with special education situations? I do, um, it, especially since my daughter's in, in special ed. In Berkeley County. In Berkeley County, yes. So um, I, there's there's a lot to need, needs to be done. Our, our special ed, they're not getting what they need. Um we, we don't offer the services um, educational-wise. It, it, it's very hard for a special ed teacher. But at the same time, there are so many different pieces of paperwork and everything else that you know, 
a, a teacher is expected to do everything, but they have absolutely no time to do anything. I, are we conflating two things here? The, the incident with this young man mm-hmm. used to be your son. This is so way beyond what we think of in terms of special ed. Right. I mean, this is this is mental illness, mental illness, not not special. Well, and and I will say that my my daughter has a similar diagnosis. She's in the special ed program. My son was never in the special ed program. Um, But a lot of his issues were made worse at school. Um, Not the way the way this the way the school system at that point in time looked at everything was well if if this child gets upset when i tell them no then we're just not going to let we're not going to say no they can do whatever that is a problem that is mental health that is behavioral that is societal that is an issue within our schools what do we know about he's a foster child that's how how it started Mm -hmm. what do we know about his his bio upbringing what I'm going for, do we know, was, were there drugs in his past? We always try to get a, a, an easy answer to some of these <laughs> things. Is, is that part of it? Do you um, know? What I can tell you is my daughter has been through a lot more than he had. Not saying that one trauma right. is worse than another. Um, what I can tell you is what he went through um, to get him in foster care wasn't helpful. But biologically, genetically, he was doomed, if, if, if that answers your question. Okay. He's very much following the footsteps of others in front of him. So for potential foster parents, yes. this is the nightmare, right? This is, this, is what would, for, yeah. this is what would keep people from becoming foster parents. It would. Now, I will say... If you want to be a foster parent, absolutely. I, even though I've went through what I've went through, I would never not do it. I always thought with my children when I was in it, in in the hard part, that I was supposed to save him. What I found out was that it, it, it was about saving both of them. But... It was not the dream I expected. I never, ever thought that love hurt so much. And I'm sorry for the tears, but um, it is what it is. Like, I I talk about my children a lot. I, I love them both. But... It is, it is the most unconditional thing to love someone and know that you're not enough and they need more than you. And I think that that's what I was put in his life for. And he will probably hate me for the rest of his, but I did the best I could for him. And I'm still, even though I'm not his parent, trying to do the very same thing. Well, you were given kind of a Sophie's choice, as it turned out. You had, to, you know, in order to save one child, you had to, yeah, make sure the other child was removed from the, the family to keep the other child safe. That, exactly. That, as a parent, how do you make that choice? That's a that's just a tough situation to be in. It, it is. It is. It's it's very tough to know that the the healthiest thing is separation. And then. What makes it even uh, more painful is you go into a state system that really isn't prepared to deal with that child. Well, the sad thing is, is, is they know about this and, and they hide it. Um, they don't care. They, they will sit there and, and look you in the face and say, you're just not loving them enough. Who's they? They social workers sometimes it's mental health providers. And we're we're told the social workers are overworked. They've yes. got a caseload that might be ten times as much as what they they should have. Uh, is it is it fair to blame the social workers in this situation? Um, you can be overworked, but 
still have compassion. And I, I think a lot of it comes down to personal bias. Um, we all have it. And um, with children like my son, who was a master manipulator, um, they pull on those heartstrings. And it's like any domestic violence situation, even as an adult, most people don't believe the victim because the perpetrator is so good at looking good. And, and he was good at this as a young child, as, if, if in your yes. book, if I recall correctly. What, oh. what age were we talking about when you believe he was manipulating the situation? Oh, he, he started manipulating when he was five. Um, but the older he got, the more sophisticated, because he, he learned the coping skills through mental health but he didn't use them for the purposes that they needed to be used. What's your uh, message to the two superintendents? So especially that we've got a new one starting Monday in Berkeley County, Valerie, and in terms of dealing with kids, and I've got about a minute for you to met to, uh, you know, kind of wrap this up. Gotcha. Uh, what would your message be to them in this situation? Uh, you know, discipline is, is necessary. I, I know a lot of people think that's like a big four letter word but um, discipline is, is, it's our boundaries. It, our brain needs that for society. We need to learn right from wrong. And um, it doesn't matter how small or big it is. Um, we have to have some kind of system that teaches us this so that as society goes and these children get older, we don't, we don't run into well, I'm going to do what I want to do. And whether it's a gun or their mouth or a car, take it out on somebody else. And it doesn't matter if it's a mental health issue or not. Mental health is boundaries and it's well-being. So please meet those needs. Well, good to see you again. Thank you. And you publish under the name Valerie Dawn, if I remember. I do, yes. D-A-W-N. D-A-W-N. So you can look up Valerie D-A-W-N, and you'll find the website and some of the works that she has uh, put out and her remarkable story with her two children that they adopted and the journey that uh, took her all through the West Virginia mental health system after that. Yeah. Thank you, Val. Thank you. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg.